Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. Uh, This is episode number 15. Thank you for joining me. My name is Ray Harkins, and I will be your host throughout the next hour or so. Uh, I know some of these are kind of running a little bit longer. Uh, I'm trying to keep it around an hour, so... um, But sometimes the conversations are so good that you just don't really want to, you know, cut it off. Be like, oh, sorry, it's an hour. See you later. Um, Speaking of good conversations, my guest today is Andrew Glover, the bass player for the band Winds of Plague. More on him in a moment. Let's get some business stuff out of the way. We are part of the Punk News Podcast Network. Uh, They are a great site. Visit them at punknews.org. They have a lot of other relevant content that if you're into this podcast, you might want to check out. Um, especially their own punk news podcast where they basically dissect the week's worth of news that appears on the site and then give their own commentary and, you know, funny inside jokes and just jokes in general. Uh, so yeah, check it out and follow us, the show on Twitter at 100 words podcast. Find us on Facebook. Same thing. 100 words or less the podcast And uh, you can also email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, it's been been slow recently on the email chain, but it's totally fine. I understand people are busy. When you're listening to this, you don't immediately think, oh, yes, I need to speak to this show. I need to speak to Ray. I need to tell him these things. So totally get it. Um, But, yeah, I really do like your suggestions. So hit us on any one of those avenues, and that will be absolutely perfect. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll keep this little short monologue at the beginning, uh, even shorter. Uh, I saw an incredible movie that I think most of you would probably enjoy in some way, shape or form, but it is made by a very polarizing figure. Uh, the director, Woody Allen, which, uh, for those of you that listened to the Matt Fox from Shai Halud episode, I think it's episode number 11 or 12, uh, he talked about how much he loves him and really, really celebrates his entire catalog. And after that conversation, I kind of was like, you know, I want to spend some more time with Woody Allen. Watched, uh, there's a two-part documentary on Netflix, and it's spectacular. Uh, just watching him work and his mentality, and you know, you really, really get to know why he does what he does. Um, so anyways, after watching that, I was like, oh crap, he's got a new movie out. So I went to go see that. It is so much fun. It's definitely the most, for lack of a better term, adorable movie I've seen of his. Um, He definitely is able to capture like a certain air of, I guess, sexiness without being overly gross or sexual. Um, Because obviously a lot of us are used to the R-rated, you know, either raunchy comedies or, you know, completely uh, semi-pornographic uh, action movies. Not to say that those are bad, because I enjoy those just as much as the next person, but yeah. Anyways, uh, so it's really funny. Uh, there's, of course, a ton of people in it. Alec Baldwin, Jesse Eisenberg, Ellen Page, because everybody wants to work with Woody Allen. But you should go see that movie, because it really did impact me in a very fun way, but at the same time, it also gave you something to chew on. Uh, the messages were very obvious. Uh, so if you didn't get anything out of it, you really might not have been watching the movie and been texting the whole time. But anyways, go check that out. Andrew Glover. He is the bass player for Winds of Plague, like I mentioned earlier, and he is our guest today. Uh, he came over to my house one afternoon uh, before we had some lunch together. And um, I've known Andrew for a while. I can't remember the first time I met him, but uh, we, and we try to identify that during the show. But uh, I got to know him a lot better when I was working at Century Media Records because his band, Winds of Plague, signed to the label. And so uh, because of that, I would go to their shows and you know just got to know all those guys in that band a lot better, even though most of them had traveled within the same scene that I have been and still am a part of. Um, so yeah, it was... Uh, an- Andrew is definitely the most sarcastic, dry sense of humor guy that I've ever, not that I've ever met, but he's definitely up there. Um, so at certain points throughout this conversation, um, you know, take, take his word with a grain of salt as far as the level of sarcasm is concerned. So, um, you know, 
to some people, like I mentioned in a previous show, they listen to this and they say, well, this isn't a hundred words or less. So don't take everything so literally <laughs> is basically what I am saying as a disclaimer. Um, but we had a great conversation. He's a good dude and he definitely has a uh, very good head and his shoulders beyond just being a random bass player for a random band because, you know, people forget about the bass players. Drummers are definitely the worst off as far as people forgetting about, but bass players are definitely in that same realm, even though they are, you know, front of stage, so to speak. Um, but I have not forgotten about you bass players, and Andrew is exactly one of those people who I wanted all of you to know more about. Um, whether or not you like his band at all, it doesn't matter. Like I've told you on previous episodes, what I want to accomplish with these conversations is not so much whether you like the bands that are presented before you, but that you get to know kind of where they're coming from and what makes them tick. Um, because I've definitely found out through either other shows or podcasts or interviews. It's like once you kind of get to know how, what makes a person tick, whether or not you enjoy them musically, you at least have a better context for why they do what they do. And that way you're able to respect it in some way, shape or form. Cause a lot of people may look at, a band like Winds of Plague and be like, oh, that band's terrible, or I've got no connection to them whatsoever. Put those preconceived notions aside, and uh, yeah, let's hang out with Andrew. Hopefully you enjoy. Also, you'll be joining our conversation right in the middle of us talking about quicksand, refuse, reunion shows, all that type of stuff, so uh, that's what we'll drop you off. Quicksand just sounded so much better than them. I mean, it's not like Refuse sucked and was like... How rich is Refuse getting? Oh, they have, they have to be. Because I, I know... I tried to figure it out with Kevin O'Connell. Yeah. And we were just like, okay, well, they got to be getting at least 10 grand for the Glass House show. Oh. At least. Dude, for sh- there was like no questions asked. Yeah. they. I know for a fact it's like for Coachella. They, they got... Somebody said like 50 grand for Coachella. Oh, no. It's not. too. Oh, they they got even higher than that. They they had to have gotten six figures for sure. Because I know when they were getting, like, I mean, they've been getting offers for years. And I know this was a few years ago that they... I feel like all this stuff we could be recording. I am or, recording. Oh, you are recording. Okay. I'm, cool. ser- I, I'm, yeah. I'm secretive like that. But, uh, yeah, for Coachella, a few years ago, they got offered, I mean, I think they got offered, you know, 50 or 60. Just, and that was when it was just a one weekend type of thing. Before. Before. And before this was like, this see, this was like six years ago. Before so before the whole you know train started to move as far as everybody being like my God this band is the best thing ever um, so yeah they had to have got six figures but I you know I don't I personally don't judge them based on that fact it's just like yeah, I would judge them if Dennis got up there and started to do a lot of the anti capitalist rants that yeah. he would do like that not even so much refusing that seemed to be the big thing that people were most pissed about totally. Like if he if he got up there and did what he did with like international noise conspiracy, then you'd just be like, dude, come on. But he got up there and he just like he did his thing and obviously was like, you could tell he was appreciative of being able to do this and kind of like still feeling connected to yeah. some scene. So that you know, I totally was like fully backed. That's good. Um, was it as good as American Nightmare? Uh, actually, that's I haven't. I haven't really thought about it in that context. I was so happy when it sold out. Yeah. And like everybody's freaking out yeah. about not getting tickets. And I was just like, yeah, you don't know what I felt. Yeah. Because when I didn't have American Nightmare tickets, I was dying. So depressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, nobody is like, who's American Nightmare? I Why know. are you upset about this? How come every Facebook status you're suicidal? Who is, who, who is saying that to you? Just, just like, like younger people, people. don't know hardcore. Yeah. Or like Got family it. members. And it's like... <laughs> well, I can understand family, yeah, well, members. family members. And then when my dad's like, fuck, I didn't get refused tickets. And he's like... Your dad said that? No, oh, okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, now you know how I felt, Dad. That's so um, funny. But there were just like people that you would never, ever expect liked punk or hardcore yeah. complaining about refused. And I don't know, maybe they were full of shit. Yeah. I, I think probably a good 30% of the American Nightmare 
population was full of shit. Sure, sure. Could have had tickets for friends of mine that couldn't get it. <laughs> right, right. There are people that just but, bought it because it was an event. Yeah. Right. But I was happy to see other people miserable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, sorry, dude. I got. Yes, I, I was what? really upset when I missed the first Suicide File reunion in Chicago. Yeah. Because we were on tour with Shy Hood. Uh-huh. Thanks for taking us out, Matt Fox. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... The second time was, what, last summer we were on a warp tour? Yeah, yeah, we did at Sound of Fury. Yeah. I was upset about that, so I missed my fair share of things that sure. I would be excited about. So when other people get let down, I'm fucking ecstatic. <laughs> You're like, now you know what it feels like <laughs> to revel in the fact that you will not be able to see yeah, this. Because... I, was, I was happy. I was so happy. Good. <laughs> I always like to start off with kind of the, uh, my first, I guess, impression of like, not only just you as a person, but the band in general. Cause it's like, I mean, it's like Winds of Plague had been obviously kicking around for a while within like the Southern California scene. Um, and I, uh, one of those token shitty California local bands. Well, and, it, it, and on it, like, it, to be fair, like, that, I didn't put you in, like, a local shitty band because it's, like, you guys, you know, worked. Like, you did as much as you could with what you were given. But I remember, like, this is when I was still uh, focused on, like, the Abacus recording side of things. And I remember the guy, Steve Joe, who hired me that worked at Century Wonderful Media. Human being. Wonderful human being. Um he so he mentioned to me he's like yeah we're talking to winds of plague and he's like you know what are your thoughts and i was like it, it was just funny because i never i never thought of you guys as being like moving on to that next level in a way you never do that because i see local bands do you remember that band underneath the gun oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like they were just little kids right and then andy sorrow starts managing them sure and then they were on Ferret, yeah, and then yeah. they were on our tour, and it was like, you guys were just like 12 yeah. years old. No, totally. And that is, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's not it's not fair of us to put people like that no, in that box. No, it's but... no insult to the man, but no. I know exactly. Like, sometimes you just, you don't picture stuff like that happening. Right. And so I, w- and it was one of those things, too, where my perception was just like, all right, Winds of Plague has existed for so long, no one had picked them up by this point. Um, so, you know, that they were, that's what you guys were going to do. You guys were just going to be like that local West coast band that did tour, whatever. So then, you know, fast forward to whatever, a year or two later, you would sign to Century Media and, you know, I had known, I, I hadn't, I don't think I ever actually officially met you I at some you point. Were passing. Right. It's like, I knew it's like, I have a bone to pick on that too. So I can't wait. Well, yeah. we can get into okay, that. Cool. I can't wait. I'm... I thought about it in the car yesterday. <laughs> Good. The, um, so, but I, I knew, I knew John because he was obviously like the, you know, the front man and the one that was like networking or whatever. I yeah. remember him giving me a, uh, cause were you in bleak December? No, I wasn't. Okay. I was a merch guy. Okay. That's good. That's... But yeah, I remember he, the band that he was in cause that was what he was in before Winds of Play, correct? Yeah. Nick, Nick and John were bleak December. Oh, okay. Kinda... Got it. Morphed him. But I just remember him giving me that, that demo. And me listening, I, there are very rare occasions where I actually listen to a demo, but I, for whatever reason, listened to that, and I was like, that wasn't bad. And I was like, he seemed like a nice enough dude. Like, because that's such a very, uh, you have to be so careful about the way that you present someone a demo, like, because they yeah. will immediately write you off if you're like, that guy's fucking annoying. You like, can't suck too much dick, but you also can't be, like, confident in it. <laughs> this is Com- awesome. Confidence the worst. I'm going to, I have a great side note right now. Please. Sorry. I, lo- I love side interrupt. notes. That's fine. There's this band. I shouldn't name names. They're called DMT. <laughs> I shouldn't name names, <laughs> but I will. They, I'm sure they're nice. Sure. They, they hit me up on Facebook, I don't know, two years ago. Okay. I had an old assistant engineer. He's no longer with me, but he was offering like the $150 a day deal. Uh-huh. Good deal. He was a good engineer. And they sent me a personal email. And they said, hey, man, we want to book some time with you, me, by name. They knew who they were dealing with mm-hmm. for $150 a day. Oh. And I said, well, I regret to inform you that I... Don't charge those rates. Yeah, yeah, that's not my rate. And they said, well, your other engineer offered to do that on your Facebook, so you're going to do it. And it was like... Oh, contrary. Right. <laughs> they were trying to hold you. I, to- I'm not. I'm not going to do this. 
And then it started off with, what a great opportunity it would be for me to record <laughs> them. And I laughed. I was right. starting, you know, I'm enjoying these responses. Of course. Because at first it was like, ah, you know, I'm sorry. Right. And then when it became an opportunity for me to record them, right. I fucking lost it. Oh, sure. I was so mad but happy. Sure. And I would just kind of respond, but it wouldn't be a super firm note because I wanted these responses. Right. They were you just, wanted to string along. They getting me through the day. Sure. Because <laughs> I was a week into a very stressful record, and I was like, oh, every time I take a break from this, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> sure. And so... The guy started talking about how he knows how the music business works, which I fucking hate when anybody tells me how the music business yeah. works. I know the game, bro. It's, yeah, okay, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad Baby Ray is not here now. Oh, so I know, I yeah, he's okay. Fuck. You can totally say fuck. Um, <laughs> when he started, he got drunk with Chris Adler at Mayhem Fest, and he knows how it works. Or maybe it was one of the Lamb of God right. dudes. And there, I just kept egging him on with kind of nose. And eventually, there was, I don't remember what the last email was, but I lost it. And I said, no amount of money will ever get you recording in this studio with me or with John, my assistant, and then right. assistant. And I said, uh, please never talk to me again. <laughs> Like, it would be a privilege for me to record your band. That's impressive. And I was so happy. I forwarded the email to a couple of people. Sure, and sure. Yes. And like, look how I handled this. This was so much goddamn fun. It was like one of those memes on the internet where it's like, like a boss. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> You're like, that's me. I want, like, I just leaned back in my chair. I'm like, Fuck yeah, Andrew, you are the shit. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, but no. That fast forward to a couple weeks ago, they've been playing some of our local shows, and oh wow, I really talked to them. I'm sure they're nice. Sure, but the guy sent a uh, mass text uh -huh. on. I remember there was somehow the oh yeah, being like handling shit the right way. That's what we were talking about, right? I sent a mass text to 430 people to thank them for how well DMT has been doing in their musical career. Oh, wow. And it was an iMessage, so you get like that preview, it's like iMessage. Mm -hmm. And I tried to load it, and it crashed my phone. Oh. And I tried to load it again, and it crashed my phone. Oh my god. And I tried to load it again, because I know it's funny. Right. And it crashed my fucking phone. Dude. So I think I, I could virus. see where it came from, like mm -hmm. his email address for his iMessage. And I sent a message that was like sort of polite, but never fucking do this again. Right. <laughs> You're and like, please lose this number. Like, <laughs> we're not friends. Right, right. I what have I done to support you? A nice guy, but I don't support you. I right. think your band is fucking annoying. Right. And you've done everything wrong. We've we have gotten off on the wrong <laughs> foot. Why are you still trying to drive this home? That wrong foot has been broken up and just I've beaten <laughs> myself with it. That's impressive. But yeah, the, the you got to be polite and yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So so jo I, I thought John was was nice in this presentation. Anyway, so like I said, fast forward a few years, Century Media releases your record, um, and it, it just it kind of you know it took me aback where I was just like wow because I mean your response on your first record like pretty I mean pretty much out of the gates where it was obviously hitting at the time when you know the beautiful word deathcore was obviously invented in some way Stop. shape or form I know but. It was, uh, yeah, so it just kind of took me back, and then, um, or like I said, it took me back, where I was just like, oh, wow, these local dudes are doing well, and it, it's cool. It, anytime a band from our area does well on a national level, like, you get stoked. Yeah. Totally. Regardless of all right now, I'm so stoked for totally. those guys rotting out. I don't know them, but they're awesome. Exactly. So it's like anytime you feel like, you know, your your surroundings are, like become successful, I was excited, yeah. so then... Then once I got to, you know, know you a little bit better just through like, you know, like you said, the casual interactions, we'd see each other's shows and, you know, you would, um, I just always was attracted to the fact that you were, you know, you obviously said what you mean, like, or you always say what you mean yeah. and your levels of sarcasm like beat mine times 10, which I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, and so, 
so yeah, that was kind of my first impression of like walking through my, you know, winds of plague knowledge from the beginning. Um, and so, well, we, I guess we can step before we get too much deeper into it. What, what, what bone do you have to pick with me? What, what, what do we have to settle? Oh, I, I was thinking when you asked me to do, well, I asked you to get lunch and then you said, yes, well, you can do my podcast. Yes. And I was, well, now I can call Ray Harkins a great friend of mine because I people will say Ray. Yes. And I'll be, yeah, Ray Harkins is a great I'm a big Taken fan because I had never been invited to your home. Right. I it was always like, hey, you wanna like go get lunch and do this interview for PETA? Sure. It's never like you wanna hang out with me and do something uh, that I care about. Okay. And you've been to my house, so I, have I been. felt like I was a friend to you. Okay. But it didn't go both I ways. was just a Taken fan. Okay. And so now I can't wait till somebody says something like, remember that gay band Taken? I can be like, Ray Harkins is a great friend of mine. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we've been able to break down those barriers. Because, yeah, I did. Yeah, so now we're friends. We, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I, I viewed you as a friend this entire time because you've always been so kind to I me. Felt like, yeah, I felt like we've been acquaintances for about seven years yeah and so. i'm i i don't think that there are uh, there's a lot of situations that are similar to what you and i have where it's like you just see people at shows and you know they're cool and it's like oh yeah like i like them i, I could you know they're I don't have lunch with everybody like that yeah. you meet at shows and like you but know in all seriousness like we hit a threshold where we went from acquaintances to friends yes. at some point, but I still never got invited to your house. I know. I right, well now now we've broken down those yeah. barriers and the feel like I can come over a lot. Right. Yeah. It's just whenever you want, <laughs> just drop by at midnight. You guys have time. a pool or no? <laughs> no pool. I apologize. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> we uh, that sucks, huh? Do you uh, want a pool? No, no. I, we have a community pool. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It's just down the street. You've been to my neighborhood, it kinda of similar Yep, thing, similar vibe. town homes. Mm-hmm. And we don't have a pool, and I'm paying my hundred and eighty dollars a month for homeowners for like some shitty playground. Sure. And I don't have kids. Well, probably the uh, maintenance of the bushes in your area. Yeah, is, I know. I know. There's always spider webs in them. Um, You're like, what am I paying this money spiders? for? Yeah. So <laughs> I, this band, my new assistant was recording, mm-hmm. lives in Rancho Cucamonga, and they know a kid that has lives in the apartment complex. If you remember, right next. Oh, sure. To my community, sure. my neighborhood. And it's just a short fence hop away, and he's getting me a pool key. Oh. So it's cool because now, like, I've wanted this pool, community pool, mm-hmm. forever. Right. And now I'm getting one for free. That's even better. And you can't ask for anything more. Because if you would have, two years ago, put my homeowners up 100 bucks a month I for a pool. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, I'm uh, in. I'm in. Here we go. I will pay you that money, and that's fine. Yeah. And I don't know. I've had a couple of dreams that we had a pool. It's like that's wow. how big of a deal it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just embedded um, in your soft I'm really excited. Well, I'm glad. I've got to go slumming in apartments, but I mean, it's, it's a pool. okay. It's a pool. Um, where? Because I have no idea where. Were you born and raised in Southern California? I was born in Phoenix. That's what I. I okay. Moved to Northern California when I was three-ish. Okay. Um, with, moved, bo- with both your parents up there? With both my okay. parents. Moved to Rancho Cucamonga when I was nine. Okay. Laverne when I was 16. Lived there with my dad for three or four years. My mom grew up in Laverne. And as you know, she passed away right after we moved there. Mm-hmm. That was right when I started getting into hardcore. So it was cool because Laverne was... 20 minutes closer to chain reaction right and La- really Laverne, was... Laverne would you consider that like the high desert in a way no, or is Laverne's that LA County is it high desert's like Victorville that's true like Hesperia and stuff like that yeah. for some reason I just hear Laverne and for whatever reason I put it up there but Laverne it's is uh, two cities north of Orange County I okay. guess it goes Laverne Pomona Diamond Bar oh, okay it's in that alright so um, kind of near the uh, oh man near Pomona it's right by the glass house okay there we go it's like white people Pomona okay fair <laughs> it's like white people <laughs> okay and so you um, I mean I, I uh, so as you were you know y- you basically view your formative years as being in like Laverne Rancho Cucamonga, Rancho Cucamonga. Okay. I went to all the ones that play well 
the core four as we have right. given ourselves that moniker all went to Damien High School, which is the all boys Catholic school in Laverne. Okay. And that's that we turned out so well. Right. <laughs> I didn't know all four of you went to that school. All four of us went to And you, did you guys you guys hung out there? Like you knew each other or Yeah, I played hockey with John freshman year, okay. sophomore year, I guess. Freshman year. Um I became friends with Nick Ace junior year. Okay. Met, Puno was a year younger than us. Met him junior year as well. Got it. And, and, then, and just for everybody's knowledge, these are members of ones uh, of play all, that yeah, currently things. exist. Yeah, it's okay. Um, and I guess we all just became friends and it's cool because when I think, I look at my life and it's like, I graduated high school nine years ago. Yeah. And the summer from after senior year has not ended yet. It's just, That's it's true. been that it's summer. extended. I have the same, for the most part, the same core group of friends mm. that I live with usually eight months out of the year. This has been a slow year, but uh, it's like we still do the same dumb shit. Like, right. think poop and parts are funny. Like, sure. think small-scale vandalism is funny and appropriate. And it's like <laughs> honking and yelling shit at people. Like, I... On one hand, I've grown up so much, and like I'm an adult, and I have a couple real jobs on the side and the band. Right. But on the other hand, like we're riding in these buses, shitting in bags, and like that's so funny to us. Right. It's like I'm still 17, 18 years old. I I think, and it's uh, I've mentioned this to more than one person where I you the theme that you're saying or. I feel like that is very indicative of our, you know, basically people between the ages of 20 and 35 right now, like that generation, whatever yeah. you call it, you know, they're millennials, whatever the fuck yeah. it is. Uh, it, basically, it's an era of stunted, stunted adolescence where it's like, because we've been involved in what we've been involved in, we're always going to be kids from that perspective. Yeah. And like, whether it's, you know, by choice, by chance, whatever, or, but just by simply surrounding ourselves with what we've been. But yeah, I just find it so interesting that it's like, cause I, I, even though I'm doing, like you said, I'm doing adult shit, having a kid and all these other things. Yeah. I, I feel like the same person I was when I was, you know, 16, like you said, where it's like, totally. it's just that extended like, summer vacation, like you're saying in a way. But I love that because it's weird. And I definitely feel like I had family members. Like I'm the youngest by, my closest sibling was 12 when I was born. Oh, wow. And it's, like, I feel like for a long time, they're like, he's just not growing up. And then they realize, like, I'm starting a business. I mm -hmm. drive a nice car. And they're like, how is this 12-year-old sure. driving an Audi? And right. they're just, they're perplexed. Like, sure, sure. How are you doing this? Like you still think shit and parts are funny, right? Right. Like <laughs> wait, you make money off of your band? Like yeah, that's and that's the the huge disconnect I feel as well. Where it's like people um, because we've been able to figure out ways to make money off of something that we love, uh, it, it it just doesn't compute with a lot of people because it's like they, they so many people are forced to take that next step to be like, yo, you got to do something fucking serious yeah. and like something that could suck your soul on some way. Yeah, I feel like that is one of just the best parts about to me about hardcore mm -hmm. is like you meet these people and sure you get your career fucking idiot hardcore kids right but you get people that just become like they're like how can i make what i love work for me totally. there's people they start recording studios or they tour manage or they become sound guys or managers or they work at labels they work at PETA. right right and it's like, look at, like, Ash or Andy. Sure. And it's both those dudes are just hardcore dudes. Yep. That are doing fucking awesome. Mm hmm And they've found a way to keep their integrity mm -hmm. while being successful and not having to, like, leave hardcore behind. Right, right. right. Or metal or whatever. Yeah. Independent music, yeah. you could say. And I, I love that because then... Like, it's great to see that, or, and there's so many people like that, Jason at To Die For, like, yep. people that it's like, I'm going to do something I like, and I'm going to do well at it, right? and I'm not going to let anything stand in my way, and then you see, like, people that abandoned hardcore, punk, or independent music 
I don't want to say abandoned because I just sound like. Different. Yeah, I know what you're saying but though. They kind of they moved on to different things. Sure. And they come back and they're so shocked that there's these groups of people here and it's like. Well, what are you doing? Oh, I just got promoted to manager at Chipotle. Right. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah. that's what you left this wonderful thing for. Sure, sure. And I, dude, I love that. I feel like it's just a land of opportunity if you're not an idiot. It, it, that's, you can I agree. Get, just be that drunk moshing guy for your whole life. Or sure. Like fall into drugs or whatever. But there's people that, like, if you're smart, you can. Yeah, I like. I, 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 I like how you put it. So great, right? And that's why I love it. Like I, so not, when you get down on life and you think like, I basically make my living in hardcore, mm -hmm. and it's like that's so. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Sick. It's a, it's a total. I mean, it's a gift, and that obviously, like you said, or it is a. People should view what they learn within the hardcore community as you know I mean, those are life lessons like you learn a lot like you know you've you've grown up primarily like on the road because like you said you tour you know eight nine months out of the year um and so those experiences obviously informed who you are and yeah. like also drove you to be like all right like i know my band isn't going to be around for 40 years so it's like well maybe hopefully you could That'd be cool that would be cool if i mean yeah, yeah you you don't jump around too much so you'll be all right yeah, dude, I got the best stage presence in the world. I know you do. <laughs> um, and so, kind of, kind of going back to your. Um, so, you, I presume you you enjoyed high school, like obviously hanging I hated out. It. Really? I okay. Hated the only reason I presume is because you obviously had well, some people. Well, I have the same friends from high school, but everything being else. A that... Catholic high school, it's just like super focused on sports because mm -hmm. that's I think. Somewhere, I don't, you're Christian, so I don't really know, but somewhere in the New Testament, it's like, talks about how important football is. Because <laughs> 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 I, every Catholic high school is football, totally. football, football. Totally. Jesus, man, football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I didn't play football. I was a nerdy fat kid. Right. And it was like, I played hockey for a while, and then I got more and more into music and right then i guess i don't know i fucking you hated, hated it got it so you're basically your your solace from that was the fact that you were getting into music yeah and, and i think that's one thing is uh with my group of friends and having them so long when i look back on high school i realized that after my mom passed away early in my junior year mm -hmm. I should have just dropped out and got my GED because I would have the same friends I have now. <laughs> I would have gotten a year and a half head start on college. Therefore, I would have finished college before I dropped out. Sure. And my life would have been better if I sure. just left then. If you just would, took that as a sign where it's like... But it's... Whatever. Uh, you, you can't do anything about it. But no. Yeah. Fucking hated that. Got it. I, I don't. I don't. Because uh, I've never actually asked you. I mean, I did know that your mom passed away. What did she? Uh, what did she pass away from? Uh, a heart attack from cancer. Really? So I'm sure that devastated you. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty rough. Shady. How long did you? So did you feel um, that you were able to kind of retreat into music? Like, was that like your main? Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And what was it like dur during that time? Kind of like, would you kind of view that time as like, you know, part of your introductory period? Or by that time, you'd already been going to shows for a the introductory period. But yeah. I went to some like pop punk or whatever sure. shows, but definitely the world was opening period. up. Yeah. And what what was your uh, what was your gateway? Like, you know, what what was the what were the things that you found yourself like really, you know, like the first one or two things that you were exposed to that you were just like, wow, there's this whole other world here. You know, just going to like shows that friend like high school bleak December would get on real hardcore shows and sure. like stick around. So you go with that stuff, yeah. and then I got into like Throwdown, mm -hmm. and I saw Tear open up for Throwdown in two thousand two. Sure. And my mind was just blown. You're like, all I'm all in and on this. I think that was the beginning of my senior year, and I mm -hmm. think I probably saw Tear twenty times my senior year of high school. That's awesome. 
when you can't see Vogel mm-hmm. on stage and not fall in love with that. Band. No, 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 no. Especially, I mean, especially during that time too, because I, <clears throat> yeah, I was just so not to say that he's lost it because he obviously still has it, but yeah, just it was so visceral. Like no matter what, no matter what you were into, if you saw that, you'd be like, "Wow, that's a great front man." He's and he's still like mm-hmm. Scott is the man. He is the man. What um. So when did you pick up, uh, I mean, is, was bass your preferred instrument? I started playing bass, I think, when I was 15. Mm-hmm. Just by chance, you were just like, oh, I'd like to play this. Yeah, I was 16. Yeah. Yeah, I played drums starting when I was 10. Okay. And then I kind of fell out of drums, got into bass. Okay. I think junior, senior year of high school, I got back into drums okay. and bass and guitar. Got it. And I think that's where I just would play anything just to jam. Sure. And did your did your parents in encourage the fact that you you know you like when you were ten we were you like I would like a drum set and your parents were like here you go or like where did that it, at first it was like no fucking way yeah yeah that's um, thanks for picking the loudest instrument it, yeah <laughs> and that's but that's what it was it was like school uh-huh. offered these the band instruments and sure. It's like, Drums. I can start a punk band. Got it. I'm 11. But sure. I'm like, I can start a punk band. I can get a Mohawk. Like, that's, Dude, that's amazing. That's I love. I love how you're. You were. That was like the vehicle. It you're was, like yeah. the drums were the vehicle for everything else that you were looking forward to. Yeah, it's because it's like, uh, <laughs> mom, I want to play electric guitar in this school band. They sure. don't offer that, Andrew. Mm-hmm. And it was like my second one was saxophone, <laughs> which I don't. Something about being a kid, you think saxophone's like super cool. Sure, in a way, it's, yeah. it's not that cool. No. It was like the second coolest instrument at the time. <laughs> right. But now, like, as an adult, I feel like trumpet is probably the second coolest. But only yeah. nerds and I or in elementary school really played the trumpet. Sure, yeah, yeah. But like Miles Davis, oh, the dude. fucking man. Give me a break. Yeah, yeah. Kenny G, not right. the man. No. He was, he, and then the, the gateway to his saxophone is the clarinet, which is like clearly that's, the lamest instrument. Yeah, that's fucking yeah. It's so lame, so lame. No offense to any. No, uh, none, none whatsoever. Sorry for saying that. It's okay. You, you, uh, you I, used it in a context where I think people understand. I, I hope so. It's okay. I'm not gonna start dropping f bombs or anything. <laughs> no, not yeah. Now that now that we've made it clear, it's a little. Bit. Um. I did want to hit on, like, obviously, as, like, I was mentioning, you know, the Winds of Plague, the, the first record, you know, that really started to kind of resonate and hit. Um, when did, well, kind of a two-part question. One, the... Can I get more water? Please get All more right. water. I want you to stay Hydrated. quenched. Um, so, yeah, like I said, kind of a two-part question. One, um, when did you, when did you feel things, like, in your own head kind of start to like change from that perspective where it's just like, wow, like people are paying attention to us or whatever. Um, and then kind of the second part of that, because obviously once people start to pay attention to you and you receive even just like a monic, like a very small minuscule part of success or what people the like her scope comes. Right. And where people, because uh, the, the immediate backlash, especially being from Orange County is everyone was just like, Oh dude, wins a plague is like, they're just a poor man's bleeding through. And like that, I mean, oh, yeah. you know, and that, that existed for, you know, probably up until your second record where it was like, you know, things started to, you know, you, you had firmly established yourself that you're like, okay, we're not just like this yeah. band's going to put out one record. But so anyway, so yeah, like two parts. Like no, you get, this is, this is how I've explained it best to people who've ever said anything to me like that, where it's just like, all right, you have a band like Bleeding Through who is clearly like just, you know, they wanted to be steeped in the, you know, black metal meets hardcore-ish thing. Whereas you guys, from an initial perspective, you know, you guys kind of just wanted to be sort of the, you know, like hate breed meets this, you know, atmosphere. Yeah. Like you guys were way more, you know, for lack of a better term, and I hate to use it, but you know, like beat downish, like and, and not, it, yeah, and and, and, and like I said, not in neg- yeah. right, exactly. Like from the first record, that's why it's like I never really understood those comparisons. But anyway, so like it was like metalcore mixed with almost real hardcore, very true. Which I feel like people hate. No one wants to admit that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no that's very true. No one wants to admit that people in Winds of Play might actually like hardcore. Right. Is that... You're that's like, that's, that's, that's just not cool. That's a devastating blow. Because <laughs> like, it's like, we can't let those nerds in our club. 
And I understand. I totally understand. Sure, I the, wouldn't want us there either. The 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 metal crew is just like, oh, these guys, like, no way, no way. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I said, two part question. Like, one, how did you kind of, you know, how did you guys deal with that as you were growing into the scene? And then two, like, when in your own mind did things kind of start to be like, wow, holy shit, like things are going really well or whatever. It, I think there was the first Thrash and Burn tour, which mm-hmm. was summer of. 2008 Eight, yeah that sounds I think right it was, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say like, we didn't feel like have a this is it moment or anything right? but it was merch was doing really well right. and I guess the economy didn't suck dick at that time so sure. that's the, those, are, those I would call the golden days of merch numbers oh yeah because there'd be days like <laughs> How much should we do? $3,000. $3,000 in t-shirts? Right. You're like, how did that happen? It just makes no sense. No, none. For one show. Yeah. And it was like, almost every night, we were fucking killing it in merch. Right. And that's, at the end of the tour, that's a hundred grand in merch. Yeah. Which is insane. I guarantee at the time, I don't want to focus too much on money. No, no. But I mean, that that's a... That's our a... guarantee was $300. Sure. And when you're and making like, like 10 times that in merch, yeah. it's like, whoa, this is insane. It was like, you understand why people stop working fast food to sell crack. Right. Because it was like... <laughs> You're like, wow. You, when, like, rappers talk about, like, they quit their job to sell crack. <laughs> sure. Like, it's I, like, you I know what? It. We should have stopped making music and just sold t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, if we would have concentrated a lot, like, we could have toured with just these shirts. and We yeah, could have could have been a touring t-shirt band. Right, right. And that's it. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> It would be like, okay, Winds of Plague, your set time is from 8.30 to 9.15, and we would just showcase t-shirts. You would just parade people I'd on be, and off. Yeah, I would be in a lot better spot now. <laughs> That's incredible. If we just did that. Like, yeah. if we had good, decent-looking people and horrible sure. t-shirts sure. walking on and off stage. We, That's, that, that is a new business model. But no, I mean, I understand what you're saying, where it's like, you, you don't, you don't you're not trotting out numbers just to be like, oh, wow, like we were making so much money. Yeah. But it's like, that's, you know, that really does accelerate it in your own head. Because yeah. back then we were making $10 a day. Right. Um, I had tried to sell every single thing that I owned. <laughs> yeah. I had tried to sell my house that I bought when I was 20. Right. Because that was, I there was a time when I told my dad when I was 18 Bleak December did a two and a half week tour and I sold merch. Sure. And I was like, Dad, if I have to be broke for the rest of my life to tour, I will do it. And so we had had that mindset and I think you have to have that mindset and that's, I think what was great about that time was that the bands that were touring had that mindset. Mm-hmm. It was like, you it's know, either all or nothing, it's, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. a lot of bands these days don't have that. Well, they, they, yeah, they don't have the, as cheesy and cliched as it is, it's, because it takes perseverance to put yourself on that line, so to speak, where it's yeah. just like, all right, dude, I'm going to dedicate these two years of my life, What you know, whatever. I mean, you don't even have to, like, put a time mark yeah. on it, but you're just like, this is what I'm doing, and whether or not this works out, like, at least I've given my yeah. all or whatever. And I, so many bands that, like, come to the studio mm-hmm. don't do that, it's like... yeah. Like, it well, needs to happen can, in like six. I can six tour when I'm not in school, and when I don't have a job, or when my work will give me off. And it's like, how long till you think that we'll be doing this for a living? And it's like, I don't, man. I don't think you're gonna do it because you're a pussy. And that's so. I think yeah, Thrash and Burn was when we finally started getting a small return on our investment. I right, guess. right. Where yes, things started to kind and of be like, oh wow, like, that's. When you come home for from two months of tour and you have a thousand dollars, was like yes. You're like this is insane. Yeah, and then after that we did uh, the Danzig Blackness of the Black tour. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks for coming to that. Too. I that was that was quite a uh, an interesting. I knew it was going to be very interesting for you. It guys. was a horrible show. Sure. Like, I was talking to this babe at the time, and you got her in for me, or helped me. Yes, I remember that. I and I remember yeah. you saying thank you very much for that because I'm I'm trying to uh, advance my. N- nothing uh, ever happened with that. Oh, well, it's okay. Yeah, at least at least I was able to help you out in some way, shape, yeah. or form. I think maybe she was a closet like Mexican metalhead, and uh, oh. she 
Maybe she was booing us. Yeah, maybe. She was one of those. Maybe she was just using you to obviously get in yeah. from that. Um, so how did, how did you guys, uh, in your, like I said, kind of part of the two part question, like how did you oh, deal yeah. with a lot of the uh, detractors of people? I mean, obviously you weren't addressing it at shows being like, John wasn't on the mic saying like, you know, fuck you guys. We're not playing their ripoffs, but you know, did oh, you guys got bleeding through was part of the question. Right. So did, did you guys um, just kind of like, just try to trot past or just like whatever? I think we kind of ignored it. The cool thing was they bleeding through were kind of friends of ours. So it right. was... I think there was, as we started doing better, there was some friendly competition, but... Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, like, they one time took us on a week-long tour. They would get us on their local shows when we were younger, and, like... Right. They were great to us, so I think that kind of helped. Like, people would... You guys are just a bleeding through ripoff. It's, like, almost take it as a compliment. Like, right. one, no, we're not, but two, like... Thank you. Leaning through is a great yeah, band. They're great. I look up right. to those guys a lot. And sure. Thanks a lot. Right, right, right. Yeah, that, and that's like, actually that's if people because if response. we were so shitty of a bleeding through rip off, people wouldn't have even like that's true. Drawn that comparison, so it was like, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. You just like you, you flipped it on them. You're just like, oh, thank you. We'll we'll take that yeah, as a compliment. Totally. Yeah. No, and that's cool. I think once when we added Kristen on keyboards, like that was oh, that's when. It really got drawn, and I mean, adding a girl was our old manager's call. Right. And <laughs> I don't have much to say about it. Yeah, no, no. Um, I, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it was what it was. Kristen helped our band out, and totally. then we got Lisa for a week and a half. And right. And we got Elena, and Elena's great. She's awesome person. She fits within the band. Yeah, and she's, I mean... Kristen was kind of put herself on a pedestal, so to speak, mm -hmm. and that pedestal kind of built itself under her, and she did like become a pseudo celebrity. Oh, whatever. totally, totally. And I don't, that was really detrimental to her relationship with the band. Because sure. When you care more about your ego than the success of the band. Well, you just. Or care more about, I don't want to say that because Kristen is. A nice person. Yeah. It's, she became a separate entity that wasn't, didn't have, wasn't Winds of Play. Right. She was building, uh, she was building her own brand by using the band as the vehicle. Yeah. And bless her. Like, it's yeah, yeah, worked I mean, it's, out, I guess, right. okay for her. She's in other bands now. And right. There's no bad blood between us and right. her anymore. It just wasn't working out. Yeah. But Elena, I feel like, well, she's kind of developed herself as her own brand, so to speak. Sure. She hasn't done it at a, what would the word be? A, de a detriment to the band, maybe? Yeah, but she hasn't, like, gone so far out sure. where it was, like, on this band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like she's definitely remained the keyboardist of Winds of Play, who also does other stuff. Right, right. And I think, like, that has worked a lot better. Sure. As far as the sanity of the band goes. Yeah. No, that... I, I can... don't know, like, success or whatever, what's... Where we're at, because especially at the end of a record cycle, you can't really tell. But, right. I mean, Elena is just the perfect fit. Sure. Which, I mean, that's, that's huge, because I know that, you know, I mean, we had more than one conversation about how you guys were struggling during that time, where it was just... Because, I mean, it's difficult when you have, though, so many... A band already has so many moving parts, and then yeah. when you have something that's even larger than just people's personalities at play, it's like, dude, it's so difficult yeah. to kind of wade and through it's, that. It's hard because there's people that, in passing, you would probably like, but you just can't live with. Right, right, right. And it happens all the time. Sure, right? sure. And at, at, at least it's one of those things where. Because of that, it didn't bring the band to the, its proverbial knees, you know, where it was just no. like, oh, we're not able to rebound from this or whatever. It's like you guys were just able to, you know, shrug that off no, and be yeah. like, all right, well, that that was what it was. Um, and the I feel like people do have so many misconceptions about you guys as a band because it's like – you. It's so interesting to me to watch you guys live because it's like – I mean, not only just because I know you as individuals, but it's just like – you guys are so, you guys are so distinctly different from one another. 
but you obviously make sense cohesively. Yeah. But it's just, it's so funny because it's like you all have these different like stage personas versus off stage personas. And it's like how it all kind of comes together. It's just, so because of that, you know, do you think that like, what's the most common misconception that people have about Wings of Plague that you've noticed where people just like, oh, I thought you guys were just fucking hard asses. And like, I, that's probably, that's it. Like, yeah. People thinking we're meatheads, people thinking we were in Mexico six days ago, a sure. week ago, whatever. Right. Um, and Nick H was sitting there playing. Nick H is our guitar player. And mm-hmm. He's just the most gentle human being yeah. in the world. <laughs> but he was playing some game on his phone because he was like a nerd. Yeah, just hanging out. And uh, this little Mexican dude comes up to him and goes, Are you angry? And he just, and when in this light that Nick was under, he looked so pissed right. and so hard. Because he's and playing it, Angry Birds on his phone, right? Yeah, and he just, he looked so fucking tough. And, like, he's got broad shoulders, kind of, so I can see, like, <clears throat> if I didn't know him, like, I right. would think he's, like, a tough-ass dude. This guy's going to beat someone in, like, ten and minutes. he's just, like... Yeah. The softest, nicest dude in the world. <laughs> totally. And this kid totally thought he was angry and just like a right. fucking hard ass. Kid was afraid to ask him to sign like a picture because <laughs> That's amazing. Nick was probably playing fucking Puppy Love with the video right. game on his phone. <laughs> That's and so I mean, incredible. Yeah, people think, I mean, and sometimes there's been situations where we will, uh, grow into that right you will play into that we will play into that like if there's bands we don't like we will let that stage persona come off stage but uh-huh. i mean you talk to john one-on-one and he's just like yeah he's a goofball goofy dude totally and everybody in our band's like that right we're we fake it well i guess right <laughs> and that that's what i find it, it, again like it just it always um it, it amazes me that, I mean, because even because how independent music has grown to where, you know, kids are going to shows like, you know, that are whatever, your House of Blues and that type of stuff, where it's like, obviously, the intention of independent music has always been to break down barriers and be like, you know, you're no different than I am. Like, I'm just older than you. And I decided to start a band like roughly yeah. the same age as oh. you. And so, but it's just like, people still do put up that barrier where it's just like, you know, like, oh my God, like, you know, here's, here's what's plague. Like, oh my, like, like you yeah. said, and like, it, it is this kind of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy where it's like, you know, oh my God, like these kids are so hard and tough. And like, it's just, I, I just find it so interesting. Yeah. I think that, that's one thing people like you always get like the old acquaintances like those guys are rock stars man. yeah like, they think they're the shit it's <sighs> like no man i it's this polar opposite thing where if there's a signing or something mm. and we'll complain about it it's not because <laughs> we think we're too good for it right it's because like you feel I'm weird. I'm just a regular dude. I'm right. gonna fucking go eat food and ride my bike around or whatever. Like, right, right, right. I don't want to like. I don't even want to pretend that I'm important enough to be putting my initials on your poster. Right, right. Like I want to go eat food and ride my bike. Right, and I, and I think and I I think that's the most important distinction. Like no matter you can do this to you know. It obviously becomes difficult if you're like an A-list celebrity, but it's like if you retain that mentality of just like. Even though I may be doing this, Wait, are you like, saying I'm not an A-list? Celebrity? You are, you are. Okay. No, no. I, I, I mean, you are the base. Hypothetically speaking, hypothetically you can speaking, do this until you become a yeah. Exactly, but yeah, no, because you, I mean, you clearly are. I mean, even though you are a bass player, and obviously, like you know, I play the dumb stick. But right. <laughs> you play I, the dumb stick. But I play it well. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and kind of uh, you know, going more personally into you, it's like I, I've always uh, admired the fact of people such as yourself that obviously take whatever money you're able to make from your band and obviously like invest it not only in your band but in yourself like you said like you know opening up your studio and doing everything with that I just always get so stoked with that because it's like so many people and you see I mean I'm sure you tour with bands where it's just like blow it on streetwear you yeah (laughs) you are making so many bad financial decisions just because you're 22 years old and you're thrust into whatever you're doing and you get either either it's bad advice or just you're because you're young you have no fucking clue yeah. what you're doing. But you always seem to be focused on the fact that 
he wanted to use this money to obviously like do something beyond just I play dumbstick yeah, in a band. Totally. Yeah, I wanted to I want to build something so people know that I'm not just the dumbstick. Like, right, right, right. I actually have half a brain. Right. <laughs> yeah, and you do there's so many bands that, like young bands uh-huh. that they just they're so obsessed with the right now. Like what can I have right now? Right. And it's these kids with like they're buying just shoes every time they get paid. Mm-hmm. And it's like you drive a nineteen ninety two Honda Civic. You live with your parents. Right. You're making five hundred dollars a week or whatever. Right. And all you do is buy Nike Docs. Right. Like, you're what like, the fuck is the matter with you? You right. could have an apartment, right. you could have a nice car, but you have a hundred pairs of dunks. Right. And it's... Is this a wise investment? <laughs> yes. And then they, like, try and explain it to you. No, but I flip sneakers. No, you don't. You really don't. You don't even this have an eBay not account. your fucking job. <laughs> Do not pretend to me that because you sold three pairs of sneakers to a kid on Facebook that, like... <laughs> You flip sneakers. Right, right. You the, don't. This is not, yeah, you do not have an eBay store. <laughs> you're, like, you're not using this for as your For Christ's sakes, move out of your mom's house. <laughs> buy a car. You stay at your mom's house. I don't care. You chore a lot. I understand. Right. You get a decent car. Get yeah. a checking account. Sure. <laughs> And do do you like do you kind of take it upon yourself to um, you know try to like watch out for younger bands that obviously like are making mistakes to a certain extent like I mean you don't want to be like become like the dad but you're yeah. just kind of like oh like why are you doing that or like maybe even if it's just like from a band financial perspective where it's like oh you guys shouldn't get a bus for this tour it's ridiculous yeah I guess yeah, in a way sort of I mean I know I know that's not like, like we've a lot of times there's like bands that spend band money on it fucking everything right and like we'll kind of scoff at them and hope i guess that's the best way to get things done if you're with a plug and like yeah. scoff at somebody sure <laughs> well i, I mean it, it, yeah it's, i could understand like, i mean that would be a motivator because if you were to like sit down and like have a heart to heart with somebody it's like you know they, they may listen but at the same time if you're gonna like you know quietly well not quietly but it, like you said scoff at them from afar it'd be like what are we doing something wrong yeah like, yeah it's like uh bands like, Oh, we open up the cash box and this guy's going to sell us an ounce of weed for $250. And it's like, really, man? Right. right. <laughs> you guys can't just all buy your own weed. Right, right. This is an and investment. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, bands that, young bands that the band buys the gear. Oh, Which yeah. I understand, like, an established band buying, the band buying a matching back line, which we did a year and a half ago. But. Mm-hmm. I remember bands that would, like, the band would buy the gear, and then the guitar player gets like, oh, I don't really like these cabs. I want to try these cabs. I want to try these cabs. And it's like, they justify it because they have an endorsement. But it's like, the band's still just dropping thousands of dollars for you to change your mind. Like, right. I think <clears throat> we made, when we were starting out, everybody bought their own gear. Mm-hmm. And if you weren't happy with it, you bought new gear yourself yourself right so or you found endorsements or whatever and right. that happens and but so many young bands are just wasting money on gear right whatever's like hot at that given moment and it, like do you know what nax effects is it's like this crazy guitar thing. it's the coolest thing sure in the world. but uh it can emulate a tube amp almost perfectly okay and it's like it's like a pod Sort of. Got it. Okay, makes but sense. But emulates perfect. Okay. And like, they're twenty five hundred dollars, and there's bands that like the band will buy each member one, and it's just like, serious man, you guys couldn't do like a couple more tours with that trusty right. fifty one fifty. <laughs> you're like, this is this is your second U S tour, and you're already doing yeah, that. Yeah, it's yeah. fucking insane. Totally. Like, does it feel does it feel weird on that same tip like to be because you guys are yeah you, know, you have three full lengths out one self release three real yeah, full lengths three real full lengths starting to record the new one right. I guess if this comes out in a month we're starting to record the new one today today <laughs> yes it roughly will come out in a month but does it does it feel weird to be sort of you know the elder statesman of a scene in some yeah, way. That's, so uncomfortable (laughs) really yeah because i think it was there was never a transitionary period where everybody 
were our peers, okay, so to speak. Because mm-hmm. it was like we would do tours where we were the young kids, the young kids, the young kids. Started doing bigger tours, so people are consequently older. So we're still the young guys, the young guys, the young guys, the young guys. And then it was like, kind of, you'd go do your kind of back to the roots or whatever thing, like go back to do smaller club tours. Right. And it's always, I'm surrounded by children. Right, right. That's true. I, I never really thought about it from that perspective. Like yeah. You go on your tours with like Hatebreed or something. Hatebreed's all mid 30s, mm-hmm. dancing 40s. 40s, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, so you're doing shit like that. And then it's like, there were a couple years where I guess just shit kind of turned around. The next mm-hmm. generation started touring and it was like, holy shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and it was, I mean, that's, I guess, disheartening, but over the last couple, for some reason, like the last couple weeks, I've had a bunch of epiphanies, kind of. Okay. Where I'm just like, I'm having the best ideas uh-huh. of my life. Yeah. That I can't really talk about on this, but I, because I want to like, Talk Flush about them at lunch. That's fine. Um, but I'm having like these great ideas, and I'm like, you know, that's not that bad. I, dude, I and it's completely. Agree with I you. realized yesterday. I thought about this in the car yesterday too, because mm. I was like, what if Bray has nothing to talk about? Like, oh, I dude's won't. not that smart. I'm I know you better you better shame. come prepared. <laughs> and I was thinking, like, as you get older, like when you're younger, it's like you aim at the big picture and it's like I want that yeah and then you don't really think about how to get it like it either kind of falls into place or it doesn't right and I realized that small steps like if your goal is a year away instead of 15 years away because it's like you're little like I want to become a professional baseball player that's right. what I'm going to do right, right. don't like think about what it is to get there but if you, like, I've started thinking more on a, like, what can I do to advance my life as in business? Sure. Because that's my main focus ever mm-hmm. since I broke up with my long-term girlfriend. Right. She was nice, though, right? She was nice. She was nice, yeah. Um, like, I'm just, I'm married to my jobs. Sure. But I've realized, like, small steps, like, what can I do in a year? Mm-hmm. Just, it's so much easier and, like, you can plan stuff. If you're planning for a year out instead of what I'm going to do when I'm growing up, like, you can start making phone calls today. Totally. You can, and it's easier for your brain to comprehend that. Yeah, and I never realized that until the last couple years, I guess. Well, even when I started the studio, I was like, I'm going to start a studio. How's it going to happen? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. And it happened. It fell into place. Right. Same with the band. But it made me understand, like, my dad is so much more. Mm-hmm. He's like, he's fucking old. Sure. But like, it's always like, sometimes you look at your parents and you're like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, yeah, they're yeah, just yeah. like, they're weird creatures. Of course. And I understand like the whole, maybe the steps get smaller, but cause like this year step, like if you're thinking a year out or two months out, like mm-hmm. it's still just as fulfilling as like the big thing. Cause you have that, feeling of accomplishment i started understanding my dad more yeah like it two well you, years ago it was like why the hell do you have to call me to tell me you're going to the grocery store right and now i understand he's like i went to the fucking grocery right. store this is what <laughs> i wanted to accomplish at this very time that's he's like fuck yeah i went to the grocery yeah. store he's like tell me what he got he's like i got chips I started drinking diet soda because the doctor said I need to lose weight. And I used my elliptical for 10 minutes. And like, like, nailed it. Like me, I'm like, 10 minutes? You're a whip. Right. But it's like, he's <laughs> stoked. And I'm like, fuck yeah, dad. Yeah, way to go, you dude. Fucking, you go on that elliptical for right. 10 minutes. You are killing Next it. Next week, you're doing 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, well, that, <clears throat> that's cool. And I do think that, <clears throat> I mean, you hit on such an important point and something that I always reflect on myself as well, where the... If you know, people always look back on their life and are like so wistful of like, oh man, I wish I could be twenty again or whatever. <clears throat> I, I don't wish that on myself at all. Like I'm so I'm happy with the knowledge that I've been able to receive and I'm so much more comfortable in my skin now at being thirty one. Thirty one. I'm thirty one. I was gonna ask you if you turned thirty yet. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I'm thirty one. I've turned thirty two this year. And so but I feel so much more like you said, I, I feel more comfortable in my own skin, but I it's because you do have that 
inherent knowledge that just comes through life and being yeah. able, like you said, to relate to your parents on some level beyond just like, you're fucking crazy. And then you're like, I understand why you're crazy. Yeah. Like there are these things that you're doing and you just, it kind of, yeah, it all balances out and the perspective of it just makes yeah. more sense. But they're still crazy. Of course. And they like, totally are. I've, the last couple of years, like parental role reversals kicking in where I have to tell my dad what's socially acceptable. Sometimes. Sure, sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> He's, I talk, I, I've gotten way closer with my sister in the last couple of years and uh-huh. she'll call me because what happened, I was born in Phoenix, moved to California and bounced around or whatever. Right. Um, my sister and brother both lived in Chicago when I was little Okay. and somehow they both ended up in Phoenix. So when I, when it looked like for a while that I was going to become a real adult, I was going to Cal State Fullerton. I worked at Nordstrom, which was like, as far as retail goes, a pretty real job. That is a very real job. decent. Yep. And so I bought my house, and then he moved to Phoenix. So now my sister sees him a lot more than I do, Mm -hmm. and she'll just call me and we'll just gossip about him. And it's awesome because it's like, he'll say things like... (laughs) He says Oriental, and but and it's funny. He's not. He's the least racist human being I've ever met in my life. Sure, but he just doesn't know. So and he'll describe things like he watches a lot of reality TV, which mm-hmm. I don't care about at all. But he'll say things like, "So yeah, it was between the fag and the Oriental." And I'm like, D-. "You're like, no, whoa, I was like, oh, wait a second, <laughs> hold up here." You're like, "Dad, you can and say like, that to me, but don't say that out." But like, yeah, but. I don't want him to say it to me because I know it's going to slip when right, he's right. at the grocery store buying <laughs> I chips I can't train you for soda. this. Right, 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 and right. so it's like, I was like, dad, Asian, homosexual, gay. Right. And I was like, and why does it matter who it is? I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't care that it's between the fag and the oriental <laughs> or the guy and the guy. Right. Like, That's I don't all give a you need to say. about your stupid show. Right. Use pronouns. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> just... <laughs> Like, just tell me that you're happy with the turnout or you're not. Like, right, Oh, right. you were rooting for the fag? Oh, oh, well, oh, okay. I'm sure the fag is happy that you rooted for him, <laughs> you <laughs> asshole. I'm sure it makes him feel warm <laughs> in his soul. Well, um, this has been a spectacular conversation. Was, and it, I, was it as good as Matt Fox's? I, it was, uh, yeah, yeah, everybody has their own thing. I, I can't compare. Will I get invited back or well, I, I got a lot of other people to rifle through first. Like in a year or two, can I get invited? In a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like once, uh, yeah, once something really dramatic happens with you. Just like if I develop a drug habit or something. Yeah. And then I kick that could, it. Dude, and then this, this this could be like your therapy session for yeah. an hour or whatever. You can talk about yeah. all the, you know, black tar heroin you hit and everything. So, yeah. Well, as long as you feel good so about it. So I got it. a lot of fucking up to do, do you, before I get welcome back. Yes. Okay. You got you to gotta fuck up pretty bad. But all right. Thank you. For hanging Thank out. Thank you. Thank I've you. had a blast. I was I, it's, so it's happy a, to do this. It's a little bit better than your average how's your record interview. <laughs> no, totally.